there's the sign that we're being recorded, which means that it is uh, episode 42 of both Laugh, the Dying Scene Quarantine Chat Show. As always, I'm Jay Stone. Uh, and to say that I am honored to have today's guest with us uh, is to grossly understate things. Um, both, he's an artist, he's a skateboarder, he's a renowned bass player. He's written some of the most iconic songs of the last three decades of rock music. Uh, his band, quite honestly, was my gateway to punk rock, and I'll explain that later as a preteen. He's the reason I bought my first bass guitar when I was in middle school. Mr. Jeff Amen, thanks for doing this. Hey, Jay. How are you doing? I pronounced that right, correct? Because I've been listening to Ed yeah. pronounce your name differently for yeah, 30 he, years. He pronounced <laughs> wrong a few times, and I just, I just finally gave up. And then, But it's, it, it's been solid the last three, four years. Um, yeah, I'm, I was thoroughly convinced it was two different things at different parts of uh, listening to live bootlegs and stuff like that. So it's, I wonder whose name is more mispronounced, uh, yours by Ed or Neil Peart by everybody. Yeah. Because forever, I I think I just learned it was Neil Peart, like yeah. recently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I thought it was Neil Peart my whole life until, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I think I heard it was Peart. I saw Getty explain it on something, and he said, it's got ear in the middle of it. I don't know why people don't pronounce it right. <laughs> just put the P and the T on the ends. It's got ear right in the middle. And I said, well, that makes That's sense. <laughs> fantastic. Um, so we, we, I started doing this uh, show that I call Both Laugh uh, at the beginning of quarantine um, because I used to be a concert photographer and that went away for a long time and our actual website itself kind of has uh, had some tef technical glitches. So I wanted to at least have an outlet to connect with people, well, to connect with people, but especially to connect with people that had their plans canceled early on during quarantine and then had to do stuff that was creative to sort of keep that thing going. Um, yeah. and, and I think you definitely check both of those boxes. I think for me, Pearl Jam canceling uh, shows last summer was kind of the first real red flag. Like that's when things started to resonate as how bad things had gotten, uh, that it yeah. wasn't just gonna be this little thing maybe on the West Coast and we'd get over it. It was like, once you guys canceled, I kind of went, wow, this is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well well, I think even when we were talking about it, we thought, well, hopefully we get a grip on it. By the fall, we'll be playing shows. I think we were pretty hopeful um, at that point. Um, but yeah, those were those were tough conversations. Um, I mean, our half of our crew was already in Albany, New York, like uh, working on the lights, and we were having conversations with the, with Keely and those folks, and and we had just finished uh, rehearsals, and and we were we had three or four days off, and then we were all getting on planes and heading east and and the you know the, the 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 red flag was that we were starting a tour in Canada and we found out there was like people from 12 countries coming to that first show in Toronto and we were like man that's an that's a super spreader nightmare right um and we we talked about that and then the next day we had to kind of make the decision and it was a pretty easy decision to make at that point you know we just thought well we you know we have to put this off a few months it'll be fine we'll and here, and here we are like year and a half later still right still not yeah. knowing you know like yeah it's, right it's kicking back up again and you're going like you know man i hope i hope we get to ohana and see her now you know right yeah it uh i think by my count because i'm a dork and i did count i think it's been a thousand fifty seven days as of today <laughs> since wow. since the last pearl jam show yeah uh, yeah we, it's been three years yeah because it was it was Fenway here, right? I believe was yeah. the last thing. Yeah. Uh, so that was like September, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be that's, three years September. That's crazy. That's wild. Yeah. I, I mean, and obviously that's the longest that you've gone without ever playing a show, I would imagine, since you picked up a guitar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the longest since I was, you know, eighteen. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you miss it, but what do you feel like you miss? most about it being in front of people or being on the road or just playing with your buds or yeah it's 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 playing with the guys i mean we've 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 had a couple jams the last three weeks and that's i miss that more than anything i just miss like i it's just that thing that happens when we play where somebody starts playing something and it sort of meanders into this thing where you have two, three minutes where you connect and everybody's looking at each other like, oh, this is like, we're doing a cool thing right here. Um, 
it's just not making something out of nothing with your with the guys that you've been doing it with forever and so you have a you have a connectedness that doesn't exist anywhere else and there's such there's just such joy in it it's like there's you know i don't think i know i don't get that sort of joy from anything else in my life like it's it's like um there's a there's a really big spirit in it so it's um i guess it would be our god you know it's yeah right it's that it's just that thing that that happens that um you know and that we didn't do that for over a year and that that's 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 tough that's tough not to have that you know yeah is that the longest you've gone that way i yeah. mean even with coming together collectively yeah for sure yeah when you jam is that just is it like the old days like 30 years ago i mean is it just you guys in a room and somebody makes something up and then you kind of build on it or do you throw a song out there and say let's play this or do you really um, just kind I mean, of mess around i mean it works both ways i i think i know stone and i always have these conversations where we always feel like you know the way we did it early on even if even if stone had two parts or if i had two parts like it usually went through a pretty heavy band filter like all the, those first three records are you know those those songs like there weren't demos for those songs you know those songs all got worked out in the room with the band and and i think we we always try to get back to that because we always feel like there was we had a lot of um creative success you know with that i think everybody feels like a real part of it because you're people are throwing out ideas and some of the ideas work sometimes and sometimes they don't and um that's sort of the, uh, it's just a great way to write a song, you know, uh, you know, and, and it's, and it's arduous because it's, uh, you know, I think sometimes, you know, for Ed and probably for Matt too, it's like, oh my God, will these guys please make a decision on what this arrangement <laughs> is. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's my favorite, it's my favorite part about playing. I mean, I, I mean, I love touring and I love playing songs live and I love being in front of an audience, but I, I like being in a room with my buds more than anything else. How long into uh, lockdown, which hopefully we're not headed back to lockdown. I mean, it doesn't seem like we will be in Massachusetts, although it seems like other parts of the country maybe not so lucky, but how long into lockdown did you realize it's going to be a while before we're all going to be uh, in a room together. So I have to do something creative. So then you started writing because for people that don't know, and we'll get into this a little bit, but you've been probably one of the most prolific songwriters that I know, um, or at least that I follow through the past 18 months. Uh, and that's just the stuff that we know about publicly. Uh, yeah. The American Death Squad thing, the um, the other side project that you have it then obviously the new album i should be outside which we'll talk about but how how long did it take for you to realize that you know i'm not going to see the boys for a while i got to do something to stay busy well i i started like i i think i was you know we were you know we we got in a car the day after we postponed the tour and we drove back to our pad in montana and um, within a week, I, I was sort of like, okay, like, I can't watch TV anymore. I can't, like, this is just insanity. Like, you know, between the, what was going on with the election and just, it, it, like, I, it was making me crazy. And I, and I had a ton of energy because I, we were, we were funneling everything towards these rehearsals and these shows. And so there was, you know, there's, you, uh, you start getting into this, mode that month or two before the tour where you're working you're working on you know the learning the songs for gigaton and learning the old songs and you're going to the gym every day and you're just getting in this you're just getting in this mode that you're going to do this thing yeah, so, yeah right so so then all of a sudden you're just like you know you're at the bus station and the bus never comes and you're like and you <laughs> got all your stuff and you're like and you, you practiced and you and so i i was like you know we were we were a week into it and i was like i gotta shift my whole thing here and so um i would just wake up early in the morning and make some tea and go in the studio and then after three or four days i'd i'd written a couple things and i was like oh, i'm just gonna keep this going and then it, and then after a week i was like okay i'm gonna do i'm gonna write a song every day 
And even if it's a one minute thing or just a weird little ethereal uh, uh, symphonic thing with a bunch of yeah, keyboard, yeah. whatever yeah. I do, I'm just gonna finish, I'm gonna finish it. And the first couple of weeks, there were like kind of long days, there were eight, 10, 12 hour days. And then, and then I realized I wasn't like exercising or I wasn't like, so I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work for five or six hours and I'm gonna finish it. And, and then all of a sudden the muscle starts, you know, starts working good and you start finding your way around the studio and you start taking chances and you, and then it just got super fun. I was three weeks into it and it just got like, I don't think I'd ever, um, and I didn't know what it was. So yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, I was just taking chances and being weird and like, Oh, I'm going to write super, I'm going to, I'm going to put the drum machine at 180 beats a minute and see what happens. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, and then it, it, there was about three or four months of that. Um, and then I, then I started realizing that I had, um, I had some stuff that was interesting and I gave, um, my friend, John Wicks, uh, for fits in the tantrums. We did this little side thing. We're doing this little side band called Def Charlie, um, that, um, he just started taking my songs and putting them into his world and was like, Rip, ripping them apart and um you know the something real that song got out there but there's there's a really great record that's almost done out of that yeah. that song is really cool i'll link to that afterwards when i when i publish this but that song's really cool and even if people are familiar with some of your side stuff like that one's even it's even more over here than some of your other stuff it's really neat yeah and and and, and the collaboration with john was key because john kept he kept falling in love with parts of the song that I, I would have like, he was like, oh man, we're, like, how about if we just like, the song's just your falsetto. I love your falsetto, you know? Yeah. And, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> that's like, that's like exposing me a little bit. Um, but then I, like, he just kept reinforcing like his belief in that, in really weird parts of like the songs that I was giving him. And that just expanded it even more. Then all of a sudden I had like, like weird confidence in things that I never had confidence <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah. I had because I had a bro, tell, you know, who was confident in me, in me. And so that was a really big part of just like, you know, pushing through the rest of this stuff and taking more chances with things. And there's a lot of failures in it. Like, and that, that those are all, you know, those are all good too. They're, they're all my kids. And, um, <laughs> um but, uh, it was just such a it's it was such a fun process and i'm still i've i've taken some breaks but i'm i'm still kind of in this mode where it's like oh i have five days let's try to, i'm gonna try to knock a couple of things out in the next five days um and it's just you know if i would miss touring but if this was if this was yeah. how i lived the rest of my life it would be pretty fantastic because i it's it's just making stuff it's just like that, that's all i want to do is like make something i, I want to wake up and i want to have a blank canvas and i want to have a painting or a song or something at the end of the day that i can go like cool that was you know like i grew creatively yeah, somehow yeah. today like with that and um um it it just makes me feel so lucky on so many levels that and, and a lot of what's afforded me to do this is that I'm in Pearl Jam and that, I'm, <laughs> yeah. that I, you know, that I'm, I don't have a, you know, a day gig and, um, and also we don't have kids. So it's like, I, you know, it's, it sort of was just this big, uh, again, blank slate in this uh, empty time for me to just to like go for it and, and make some stuff. When you'd pick a project, uh, to write for during the day or when you'd start a day writing, maybe this is a better way to phrase it. Would you write for a project or would you say, I wanna write this kind of song today or I wanna write on piano today or I wanna write on the 12 string today or does it just kinda like throw a dart out there and see what happens and then pick something? You know, I wasn't thinking about it too much. Sometimes it would be like if I was, you know, the night before if I went over to the piano and I, came up with a cool pattern or cool melody or, or just a chord even um um or if i was if we we're watching you know we we're you know watching Shit's creek 
and I have my <laughs> I have my acoustic guitar on the couch, and you come up with a weird tuning or a weird little pattern. And sometimes that would be the thing that the next day you start with. You you know record it on your phone, and you so you have this little this little idea. Um, and then you know a month or two into it, you're like, oh, I haven't written um, like I'm gonna write a like up tempo ballad like what what you know what style in all this stuff am i not touching on and and then i would push myself sort of into those corners and just try to do something at a different tempo with a different feel with a different vibe um different tuning different instruments you start you know starting songs with different instruments like um you know there's a couple songs that started with like a melodica. I was just gonna say that, yeah. Like a melodica loop or a kalimba loop or just creating little loops on my phone that that would be the first thing that would go into the tape machine and then you just build something around uh, some arpeggiated uh, melody that you could you can write, you know, three, four parts or two parts around. Um, and uh, and it's it's, you know, it's, a lot of it's like me not being uh, like being a horrible drummer and being not skilled at some of this stuff where you're just trying to um, uh, do just enough to give you, yeah. uh, you know, the to, to initiate a song. So um, first off, I love that you were one of us who uh, binge watched Shit's Creek during oh quarantine. God. We watched my wife and I watched it and we have a 13 year old daughter. She turned 13 during quarantine, which is a weird time to turn 13. Uh, turning 13 is a weird time anyway, but yeah. to do it during lockdown. Uh, yeah. But we liked it and thought it was like up her alley enough that then she binge watches. So we effectively watched the whole thing twice, like in a Maybe. row. Yeah. Um, but for people that <clears throat> I think that most uh, longtime Pearl Jam fans will be familiar with some of your, um, some of the songs that you've contributed both to Pearl Jam and to your solo and outside projects over the years. But if there's people who just know you from songs like Jeremy and Why Go and whatnot, uh, there's some really interesting feels, uh, not just on on this album, but throughout your sort of solo and side project career. But uh, you mentioned the melodica. That was the first thing that I thought of. I said, wow, if somebody only knows Jeff Amen from, because he wrote uh, Jeremy 30 years ago, this is going to be like, talk about left field. <laughs> <laughs> which is awesome, which I like, which show, um, and I love when people uh, show growth and take chances as artists and whatever, but, but that's got to take some people uh, aback a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I get the most excited when like I get a, a really weird song into a, on a Pearl Jam record. That, that's so do I, I. I, I'm more, I get more excited about that than having a song that would be a single or, you know, that has a pop. I mean, I, you know, the pop craft is an incredible craft. Like people that can write hooks and all that is amazing, but that's kind of not my thing. Like I, I sort of like to, I like repetition and I like, I like music that makes me feel lost. In, yeah. In music and, um, and I like, and I like weird music. I like, you know, and, and not, and not necessarily like, you know, Frank Zappa or whatever, <laughs> right. but, but, um, and I love Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart and all that, but um, but I just I don't know. I like I like music that sort of uh, can paint an environment and put you in in that environment when you hear the song, and whether it's melancholy or happy or goofy or whatever. I I um I I, I appreciate the outside painting outside the lines. You know, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that stuff. As as a longtime fan, it's been one of my favorite things, really, since I would say probably since Yield. Uh, I, I like to buy the albums at midnight at an actual record store when they first come out, um, which, which is exceedingly hard to do nowadays. But yeah. uh, I used to like to sit down with the liner notes and read along the first time I listened. But now I like to. And my brother, too, he's a music teacher and a longtime fan. And we both will try to figure out who wrote a particular song it right. like only Pearl Jam does that apply to but to figure out like whose song that is and then to go through and read the liner notes and figure it out it's it's right. a fun little That's challenge awesome. and you and you get sometimes do you get are you totally wrong I've been wrong yeah I've been wrong um I'm trying <laughs> to think uh I didn't think Yellow Moon was your song 
wow. that's one that sort of sticks out. It's like, wow, that because I, um, yeah, that's one that sort of sticks out in my head is, I, that's weird. Uh, maybe Pendulum too. I didn't yeah. think was necessarily a Jeff Ament song, which was cool. I, I, I like being surprised by that. And that that that's one of my favorite things that I've ever written. Like I, we had that we had that song around the album before, and I was pushing really super hard just because Ed had initiated a melody that I just thought was super strong and I thought it was I thought that song was really sort of cinematic and cool sounding and um it's one of those songs that you hear and you go wow that's cool because it's so different I mean I'd like I mean I'm a punk rocker at heart so I like the fast you know two and a half minute songs but uh that's a cool song and I like those moments songs like like that or like push me pull me or um right. help help or yeah, yeah like are those songs that you wrote for pearl jam or did you just try to or were you just writing stuff and then you said uh oh, let's see if the boys will dig this <laughs> yeah I, I mean help help was like a I, it always felt like kind of a jane's addiction kind of a song to me um and and ed did a really cool like he 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 kept it you know in the spirit of my original demo and um push me pull me you know i always i was a teen like i love that i love that song i, I was a teeny bit disappointed that the verses were spoken word because i felt like it I, I felt like that song could have been like a just an up-tempo kind of police jam oh okay you know, like i i, I and, and, it, and it's a weird time signature too so i just felt i i when i brought it to the band i thought oh yeah this is going to be a no-brainer like everybody's going to you know yeah um but but that songs both those songs have been fun to play live the last six seven years because like help help kind of got heavy you know there's like a almost gets into a, like a zep yeah zep kind of thing live which is super cool and you, you always wonder if those songs got played live a little bit more what they would develop into you know like once the band really got a hold of it but um, yeah. Are those songs that you hadn't necessarily played live? Like, will you play a song like that and work it out uh, in a jam space or whatever before you go in to record it? Or does it sort of change while you're recording? Like the first time you played Help Help Live, was that after it had been recorded and when you were like on stage? Yeah, yeah. Both those songs are sort of written, are sort of, you know, you sh maybe you play the demo and once and then you sit in a circle and sort of, learn the song and then you know maybe everybody tweaks you know the parts like I, I'm, I'm always i always want like you know the guitarist and the drum everybody to sort of make the song their you know change it however they need to um, um i'm I, I i you know I, f I feel i always feel like i'm pretty open to that like i you know you want the band to own it and even if they're writing a new part for it or whatever like i whatever makes the song a pearl jam song so. Did you write lyrics all along and they just didn't make it into an album before Yield? I think one of the things that made Yield one of my favorite albums is that there's like you've got lyrics on there. I think Stone has lyrics on there too. Uh, that it was sort of like it's the same band, but it's now not just musically different perspectives, but lyrically different perspectives mm -hmm. as well. Were you always writing lyrics all along and they just weren't necessarily on an album? Because at least as my brain remembers, I feel like pilot was maybe the first song that I remember that you wrote lyrics for. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, the first band I was in, um, the hardcore band, Drain's Diction was, I, I wrote tons of lyrics in that. I wrote yeah. songs in that band. Um, and then I wrote lyrics for a song in Green River called Tunnel of Love that like is, I think the song that Steve Turner says is the song that made him quit. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I think it has like, you know, it's kind of proggy. It has, yeah. like, it has like seven parts or whatever. <laughs> Maybe not the strongest melody. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, I mean, Mark, you know, starting with Mark, like, uh, well, even before that, like when Rod Moody joined Drange Diction, he was such a great songwriter and great lyricist. And then, and then Mark, of course, and Andy Wood, and yeah. then segueing into like, you know, making Temple with Chris and, and then, you know, Ed, Ed's like, Ed just gets better 
every record lyrically, like he, the way that he can turn phrases and, and just come up with like really super original things that you think you've heard somewhere before. Like he, he comes up with these lines where you're like, I feel like I've heard that before. Oh no, that's like, he came up with that. Like they yeah. just kind of a writer. Um, so when you have those guys in your, in your band, like you're not, you know, um, you're not pushing your stuff yeah you know, into those situations i do think like every once in a while just having a couple different lyrical uh things on our album like i know just when i you know bands that i love you know you think about the, the clash or whoever like whenever somebody else wrote a lyric or sang a song it, it always kind of adds to this uh, it's just it just it just opens the band up a little bit more um and, and gives you uh, a different flavor. And I think, you know, over the course of 11, 12 songs, sometimes having a couple of those songs that are outside, um, it just makes it feel like a band, more like yeah, a band. Yeah, yeah, you know? sure. It sounds that way as a listener too. It, it, yeah. I find it to be uh, entertaining. A, because I like to figure out who wrote what and who kind of brought what weird feel to the table. Um, yeah. But B, because it keeps things interesting. It's not the same record uh every couple of years with the same 12 songs on it just with different titles yeah and, and when we were finishing up no code i think that record was really hard for ed to finish up and i remember him i remember him at the end of that record saying like hey um, it'd be great if you guys brought in a couple complete things next record just so it's just not me in here trying to like finish these tw 12 tunes like and so that you know we sort of you know we took that we took that to heart and we came in with pretty you know pretty good songs you know i think stone came up with some great songs on yield and um so you know that, that that's sort of all it took was just for just for ed to say he wanted some he wanted some help and yeah, yeah. and i think he wanted us to sort of see you know it's like if you're the guy that has to sort of finish up the work on a couple of songs you sort of it, in the band context yeah, yeah. With it's it's hard to sort of please everybody and like and then finish it um and and i think he wanted us to see like i'm doing 12 of those those things that you did two of <laughs> yeah yeah, I, yeah. i've right. been doing 12 of those things and so you you, you know it, you you definitely have a, a, a you know a refreshed uh, appreciation for how hard he he works Getting back to the the new solo record, I should be outside. Um, where did you record it? The first thing I thought when I put on my headphones to listen to it the other day is, this album sounds really good. Like not just that the songs are really good and interesting, and because they are, but it sounds really good. It sounds it's a big uh, sounding album. There's a lot of layers. I obviously I'm biased, so I like when the bass and the drums are sort of a little up in the mix but where did you record at your home place or yeah yeah that was all it was all everything was in montana except for um the drums on i hear you band with matt chamberlain he oh, okay like those were the first two songs i got finished and it was because matt was the only guy i knew that was that could do it yeah the studios weren't open yet but he had his own studio and i knew that he uh could, could run the you know, he, he could run his own studio. And it was it was kind of a big call because Matt Matt's like Matt's a pretty in demand. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Drummer. And so I, I it was almost a sense of desperation. I was like, God, I have all these songs and I don't have drums. You know, I have like my drum loops or my drum machine things. They're 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 not um particularly dynamic uh drums on a lot of this stuff. And um and so I, I like sort of, it, it took a couple of days to like reach out to him and go like, hey, I got these songs and they're, I think they're pretty good. And I think, you, you know, and he was like cranked to do it and knocked them, knocked both of them out in a day. And, um, you know, I sent them to him one day and I think the next morning he sent me something back at noon, had a couple of little tweaks on it. He worked on the other thing that was, you know, all of a sudden like, you know, Four days after I first reached out to him, I had two songs that were kind of largely done. Yeah. And that was when I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a record. I'm gonna make a record out of this. And and then uh, within three weeks, uh, Richard Stuverud, um, I'd been asking Richard all along and he goes, hey, my friend, like, you know, 
we're, we're just got vaccinated and we're going to mask up and we're going to go in. And so I think it was the first thing that his friend did um, at his studio. And um, so he got drums on, I don't know, it was another five or six things. I think a couple of the things are my original drum parts because I, you know, fell in love with just some part of that vibe or whatever. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I have a big room and um, I, and then I have the control room that I record in. So that's a tight room. So I sort of have these two uh, unique sounding spaces that I can, uh, you know, and then Josh did a, Josh and John both did great, a great job uh, mixing the songs. So, but it's, it's is that the, the same way you've recorded album. other solo albums? uh yeah kind of you know usually i would have these songs and i would go i would either in montana or in seattle i would uh record the songs with richard um and that and this so this this was a lot different um because the drums were the last thing to go on these recordings um and usually the drums are sometimes i won't even keep the original uh you know, guitar, bass, piano, that's on the original drums. Um, it's it's getting a, an arrangement of, of the song down so I can build on that. And so um, this this record was really approached differently than anything I've ever done. So because of that, because of the drums. Yeah. And for people that don't know, Richard has been, he's been on most, if not all of your sort of other side projects over the last 25, 30 years from Three Fish, Trace Mountains, Random. Um, and I think he was even on, like you said, your solo albums too. It's a phenomenal drummer. And I knew him first from the Fastbacks, uh, yeah. which who I think I saw for the first time opening for you in Hartford 25 years right. ago, a right. rather a rather infamous show in Hartford uh, 25 years ago. Um, yeah, he, phenomenal drummer. And he plays with a, such a different style than uh, than a Pearl Jam drummer, for example. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, he, he has, he plays with a, he, um, uh, he plays with a passion, you know, like there's, it's, and the passion can be joyful or it can be, there's a lot yeah. of anger and he, he can tap into both those things and it, um, he's really super expressive and he's, and he's, he's fun to work with. Like I, like, early on like i remember making those three fish records we were like trying to approach those records in a really different way so we were take we took away his symbols and we were, like had all these weird african drums yeah and, and and he was just he was just fully game like he was just game to you know do anything new so now we have this pretty wide palette of, of things that we can do together like i can say like hey can you approach that like that song we did 25 years ago yeah, where, yeah right you know, symbols and it was concert toms or Taos drums or, you know, and he, he can tap into all those different flavors and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Are you still writing songs too, or now that the album is coming out next month, have you kind of dialed it back a little bit in uh, order to do art and promotion and stuff like that? Or? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not doing a ton of stuff, um, for this. Um, uh, I, you know, what, what I threw out there is I said, Hey, if you can find 10 people, I can kind of go deep with. Yeah. Like that's kind of what I wanted to do. Um, rather than necessarily go with the, the biggest, Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times it ends up just being about, about Pearl Jam or whatever, which I, right. I, I, there's not really that much to talk about with Pearl Jam right now. Other than that we're hopeful. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You know, I think we have four shows this fall, which we're, I hope we can hang on to that because there'd be a lot of joy in playing those, those four shows. Um, but, um, it's, it's always fun to read Pearl Jam press in non album years. And because yeah. the one or two interviews that'll leak out, it's, well, we might be recording. And then, so everybody's like, Ooh, ooh they're recording, they're recording. And then it spreads like wildfire. Oh, that so, and then people try to figure out what that means in terms of a timeline and what, and nobody's ever right. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden gigaton bush like drops out of nowhere on us. That was awesome. Yeah, and I think you know, there's a part of us right now, like we haven't played those gigaton songs yet, so we we don't want to put a whole ton of energy into anything new yet because whatever we do that's new, we want it, we want that to have energy to go out of the world, and we we still have this 
record that we're super proud of, like, that we haven't played live, that we want we want to have energy to put into those songs and get those songs out there. So we're we're sort of passing songs back and forth, and we've had a couple of jams, but we're I think we're gonna wait until you know we yeah, can yeah. send off this next group of songs. So are you you must be excited to play songs, especially some of your contributions, especially to Gigaton. Uh Quick Escape is one of my favorite. It like the first listen, I went, wow, this is one of my favorite songs ever by anybody. Uh, awesome. That's that song's got to be a song that I would imagine will translate really well live. But are you kind of itching to get that worked out? And yeah, I mean, we you know we we rehearsed more than we've ever rehearsed um, a year and a half ago. Like we you know we spent two solid weeks like going over the minutia of. And, and, you know, and because technically there, there were some, you know, dance the clairvoyance and even like uh, All Right and River Cross, those songs, like those songs were, were hard to figure out how we were going to make them work live. And so um, it's, it's almost going to be like going back to ground zero with those songs because yeah, right. um, we didn't get a chance to like, repeatedly play those songs over and over again so um you know it, we're probably going to need another two weeks <laughs> <laughs> that song's gone well you've got it's going to be fun september maybe in jersey that's the the first thing on the radar yeah yeah i think uh what is it the 20 or i can't remember what it is 20 or is it yes the, it's the 20 something yeah, yeah danny clinch's big right. thing yeah mid-september yeah yeah, yeah. Um, regarding the new album, um, lyrically, it, it's a heavy album, although you sort of expect that given the weight of uh, the time that it was written in. Did you, when you were writing songs, and particularly when you were writing a song a day, were you working on lyrics as well, or were you writing the music to a song every day? Because it's a really interesting album lyrically. It's heavy and it's angry, but I, but there's a little hope in there too yeah well it, it's it's crazy like in february uh we we lost our dog otis who sweet oh, boy that's the last song yeah was sweet. And then we lost our cat a week later um who killer on the american death squad that that's her yeah, yeah. um and then the, and then in march um like i was into i think i was into recording um for a week and I lost a classmate of mine who I was really tight with uh, as a kid. Wow. And then I lost two more, I lost two more friends in April. Like, so it, when I was wow. in the middle of the thing, there was, there was quite a bit of death that I was processing. Yeah, right. um, and other than Otis and killer our cat, um, who I got to be there with through the whole process. Um, my three friends who I lost, like I couldn't go to the funeral. I couldn't, go hang out with their family and their friends. Um, and so this was kind of my way to like, uh, just grieve and go through the process and try to write a tribute <laughs> um, yeah. with all, all of these folks. Um, and so I think that that was sort of, that was sort of how I, you know, n none of these uh, people or, or pets died of COVID, but like, <laughs> It was in the middle of lots of people dying from COVID, so I right. think I felt like I was uh, I was sort of in tune with what was going on on the whole planet. Um, but uh, and and initially there was no intention for the songs to be out, to put the songs out there or whatever. It was just sort of you know it's like it's the overused word you know when you're songwriting with the catharsis of like just yeah, yeah. it's like being creative when you're dealing with the stuff, but um. Um, yeah, and I, I still feel like I haven't, you know, my, my classmate, I, I actually did get to meet up with some friends late last summer, and we actually went out to this uh, grain bin that was on his parents' farm that we used to go have beers at, and we went out there and we had beers and told stories, and so yeah. that, I, got, I got to kind of work through that, but my other two friends, I really haven't gotten to get together with, like, his, their families or friends, so... Um, uh, still, still needs to happen. The grief process is hard enough 
anyway, anytime you lose somebody. So for those people like yourself and, and thankfully uh, knock on wood or whatever uh, my dining room table is made of, uh, I haven't really lost anybody within like a couple of circles um, personally since COVID started, but not being able to grieve by going to uh, a wake or a funeral or even just to go hang out with a family after a while, I, I can't imagine the things that so many people have been going through the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, all the stories and the footage of, you know, people not being able to be in the hospital room, you know, with yeah. their husband or wife or father or mother or kid or whatever it is, like that's that's just heartbreaking stuff. So, um, um, you know. I, feel, I, I, you know, as hard as it was, I still feel like I have a lot to be thankful for, you know, like, I, you know, but, um, and, and, and again, just like having the songwriting, yeah, yeah. me to like work the shit out, you know, right. uh, you know, it's like, uh, it feels miraculous at times that, you know, you just, it allows you to sort of hit something head on and come out with something that's positive and uh, tribute in tribute form and uh or something that makes you laugh or some happy right. moment it doesn't always have to be like you know dirty and dark and yeah, yeah. that's like i said it's a heavy album but there there are i think at least if i hear them right some hopeful messages on there even even uh i hear you the first one of the first singles that came out is a little angry at the situation that we're in, but it, it, I think it comes from a place of wanting to understand and wanting to be connected. And so that anger that you can't be necessarily, but that doesn't necessarily come from a bad place. It comes from a from a positive place, right? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to be light and funny with that song, you know? Um, um, and the, you know, the, the, the message is like, I hear you, like, you yeah. know, like I, like, like, please tell me, like, why, like, and, you know, because we all have uh, people that we love that we're on opposite ends of the spectrum with this, what's going, you know, how people think about all this stuff, all the politics and the, even the, you know, with the vaccines and wh whatever. And so. Right, really pick I, your, pick your issue. And <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. But, but, but our, you know, your, your job as a friend or as a, you know, a son or whatever is to like, is to listen and to, you know, share your concerns, you know, in a non condescending, non judge, you know, in, in some ways it's like, I wrote this song to just sort of just tell myself over and over again, just keep listening and like, don't condescend and don't be a jerk. And, and in a lot of ways, I think it's, it's sort of the, the worst thing about the Democratic Party is is that condescension and that, like, I'm more educated than you yeah. mentality. I think is I think it, they they just they just lose the middle and lower class because they're like, oh fuck you, like right, you know. right. So, but um, but yeah, you know, like, and and and, and bandwidth too. Like that was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna write a song with baby in it. <laughs> I've never done a song with baby in it. There's melodica so, like, on that song, and it, you said baby in it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that was like, uh, yeah, that that was one of those moments that made me go, oh. Another moment that made me go, oh, there's a flipper song on this album, which, yeah. uh, where was the inspiration for a flipper? I mean, flipper for, I haven't been around in forever, but I don't think I had thought about flipper since like my early years of listening to punk rock in the mid nineties, they were kind of one of those bands that came on my radar. And then uh, that came up, I went, holy shit. <laughs> That's an obscure reference, but I loved it. Where yeah, did that come know, from? Like, like I, I feel like, I'm, I'm sure you do this too, but I, I, I have all these songs that like, when you're in a certain predicament or you're in a situation, immediately a song comes into your head. Like, like I, I always sing the Black Flag song, Gimme, 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 when yeah, yeah. I see somebody being greedy. Yeah. You know, like, and whether it's on TV or you're, you know, in a situation. So, that, like, that Flipper song, Life, is one of those songs that, like, when somebody is like, 
have an existential crisis about what's this all about, whatever. I always, I always say like, well, life's the only thing worth living for. Like, right. in the, you know, in the words of the, you know, Will of the great Will Shatter. Like, <laughs> right. Uh, and I've, I've honestly referenced that song so many times in the last 35 years or however long. I mean, that, when did that record come out in like 1983? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say 86, um, but maybe even earlier. Yeah. Um. And so I was just, I, that was the one song that I recorded in Seattle. I was in Seattle, we were mixing a bunch of the tracks and I said, hey, John, like, will you just like spend this next hour with me? <laughs> and so I laid down the drum beat and laid down the bass part, put a bunch of feedback guitars on it. And then all of a sudden it started having this other flavor to it. So I put the piano on it and, um, and I laid it all down in like an hour. And John was like, wow, that's really cool. And that's all it takes is for yeah, one yeah. person to tell you that something's really cool. Right. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna make this, I'm gonna make this good. And I think I resang it a couple of times. And then um, yeah, it's like, you know, a, a tribute to, you know, a band that made a huge imprint on you, you know, like they wrote these simple songs with incredible lyrics, and there was like sarcasm, and you almost didn't ever know really if they were being funny or yeah, hard right, or right. whatever but like um i i i replay you know i go back and listen to those that, that flipper record and those singles all the time i think that was the hallmark of a lot of the classic punk rock stuff at least the stuff that i gravitated towards was fast simple funny but not necessarily like but like you said there's a grain of truth to it and you never necessarily know how serious they're being and yeah that's yeah, I mean, I mean, San Francisco had a thing going on too at that time. Like Jello Biafra was right. king, right? Of, like really, really smart lyrics and making fun of you and making fun of himself, and you know, really like sarcasm at a really high intellectual level. You know, which which is what I ran into when I came. I, I always say that that was like sort of like my schooling for meeting people in Seattle because Seattle is the same thing. It's like the sarcasm level was like, I'd never been around that, that level of sarcasm. Um, you know, truly the the offspring of David Letterman and Jello Biafra, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. I, I think that, and when I said sort of in my uh, rambling introduction that Pearl Jam was very really, very really the gateway for me into punk rock. I think that uh, I remember I remember hearing The Clash when I was a little, little kid, because I remember seeing the Rock the Casbah video on MTV and thinking, what in the hell is this? It's, it was so different from anything else that I had seen. And then, you know, I, whatever, I was a kid. But I think that, you know, Dead Kennedys, you just referenced, were one of those bands that I sort of got into through Pearl Jam. Uh, and so because of you guys talking about bands like Fugazi, um, bands like the Dead Boys, you know, and sort of explaining that part of it that's the way that we used to find music back in the day uh -huh. we, obviously we didn't have spotify i know i don't need to tell you that but uh <clears throat> that's how we found music and for a lot of people their gateways were other things but mine was pearl jam which is maybe not necessarily a common gateway into punk rock but it's very really the reason that i that i got into the music that i've listened to for the last 30 years i mean at the at the core of our band is that you know is that diy punk rock thing like you know, even even though Mike and you know Stone, especially early on, like they didn't they didn't come up they didn't come up playing their instruments through punk rock, but both of them got turned on heavily to punk rock at some point. You know, in the journey and and you know, at, just at the, at the core of what we do, I mean, the reason that we started playing music was was because of punk rock and and. You know that that can mean a lot of different. It can mean a lot of different things. You know, like oh, absolutely. Punk rock early on was a lot of different flavors, but you think about all the great all the great post punk um, music that came out, and you know, it, it, it took me ten years before Ed and I had a conversation about how important Public Image Limited was to both of us, and we we were, we were both uh, fell in love with different records of theirs, but like yeah that turned into us playing public image you know the song public image um and you know 
that that's that's the that's the cool thing about this band is 30 years in we're still like we're still finding out yeah about songs that we both loved or bands that we both saw early on at different in different places in san diego or chicago and seattle and so was there were there shows in montana when you were growing up nah, or did you have to go to seattle i saw i saw rock shows um i saw I saw every rock show I could see when I was a junior and senior in high school. So I saw, uh, I saw Van Halen. I saw Van Halen when I was a sophomore. I saw Billy Squire. Okay. Uh, Pat Benatar and April Wine. I saw Eric Clapton on my birthday, on my 18th birthday. Wow. Um, I saw Styx. Uh, that was actually the first concert I ever went to. I saw Styx before they were Styx. It was yeah. uh, like 1975. Um, but not much. Like, I, you know, then when I was in college, um, there were a few rock shows. I saw like Laurie Anderson and George Thorogood. And, and then we went to Seattle and saw The Clash and The Who that yeah. year. And then, you could and then, do worse than that. And then I saw X okay. like, the, the day before I saw that show. And that was, I had a friend that was living there, a Montana kid, this guy, Randy Peprock, who um, my whole sophomore year of college, he was like, you know, I saw Bad Brains last night. I saw the Black Flag. I, you know, it was killing me. Like, yeah. And uh, so before I even finished my second year of college, I, I moved to Seattle and lived in this closet for a couple months. What's the, what, how far away is uh, where you grew up in Montana from Seattle? Uh, well, I, so I was, um, I went to college 250 miles from where I grew up. Um, and then Seattle's another, 500 miles so like it's seattle 750 miles like i'm almost as close to minneapolis as i am in seattle like we're kind of in a a, a bit of a, a a desert island when you come from the northeast and even though i come from i come from new hampshire originally which is a small uh, one of the few states that pearl jam has never played in by the way uh not that they're not that you would uh yeah. where would we the, play if we played there now yeah. Is there an arena there? <laughs> there? There's a sort of small arena in Manchester, which is the biggest city, which like I saw Petty there. Uh, bands like, I mean, big shows that come to town either play there or they play, there's an amphitheater up in like the White Mountains area that does okay as like a secondary or maybe even tertiary market. Yeah. Uh, but like Dave Matthews will play there and they have a bunch of like, pop country is really big in New Hampshire for whatever reason uh what, so, what what's the venue up in the what's the amphitheater it used to be called meadowbrook i think that it has uh i think that it has some corporate name now it's in a town called guilford it's right on like right near like lake winnipesaukee which is the big thing in new hampshire the big lake but so trying to think of what would 750 miles from where i grew up be for reference i'm driving to pittsburgh tomorrow <laughs> And right. that's, I think, 540 miles. That's like a nine hour drive. So you figure another couple hundred, so like probably here to Chicago, I yeah. would think. That is yeah. wild. Yeah. Because, you know, you grow up in New Hampshire and you think, Jesus, I have to drive an hour to Boston or two hours to Providence or, you know, two hours to Portland, Maine, I guess, to see a show. 14 hours or whatever the hell it is is mind-boggling. Yeah, and, and even those, you know, like the Billy Squire shows and the I mean, those shows we had to drive to Billings for, and that, that was like 250 miles, you know, that was a, that was a haul. Um, and we would do it in one shot, you know, we would like drive down early afternoon, see the show and then drive home and get home at four in the morning. And, but I, I don't think we can comprehend, unless you get outside our little uh, enclave in the Northeast, it's, it's wild to think that like New the six states that make up New England, would fit easily inside Montana. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, <laughs> like right. I have no no way of putting that into any other context except that the entire region I grew up in would fit pretty well inside Montana. Yeah. And I was just thinking, I was like, oh, some good friends of mine played Montana the other day, one of their first shows back. And then I was thinking that, oh, that's probably like five hours away from where you are and it's the same goddamn state. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, it's eight, I mean, it's 800 miles across. So it's a big state, you know, so. It really is. It's 540 miles from Boston to Pittsburgh. 
So yeah, yeah, here you go. <laughs> um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about uh, skateboarding, because yeah. obviously for a lot of people, punk rock and skateboarding go hand in hand. You're wearing your Montana Pool Service hat. Uh, I don't know that people necessarily know. Obviously, diehard Pearl Jam fans would, but uh, the Montana's Pool Service you've had for 20 years or whatever. Anyway, building skate parks around especially underserved areas in your, like in, in um, Nevada, um, in Montana and South Dakota and native reservations. Where did that idea come from? That's a phenomenal, phenomenal idea. And I say that now knowing that a uh, guy who just won an Olympic medal in skateboarding for the first time, Manny Santiago, he grew up like 20 minutes from where I am right now, got into skateboarding because outside the Boys and Girls Club in Lowell, Massachusetts, somebody built a skate park and now he won an Olympic gold medal for Puerto Rico. But yeah. like, how, where did that idea come from? Well, I mean, I grew up skateboarding and had a ramp in my yard. And, um, and then as uh, things started picking up with Pearl Jam, I started skating again because I, I, we were in Australia and there was a ramp on the beach and we were staying at. And, and then I, I got to be friends with, some folks around the country that still skated and so they would you know it just became this thing and then in the northwest pacific northwest late 90s like burnside and portland and there they built a couple backyard uh skatable bowls in west seattle i got to be friends with those guys um and then the you know the we tried to get a skate park built in in missoula and uh it's it was a really arduous process it took five years uh, we were a year into it and I was like, wow, this is never going to happen. So I built my own little bowl in my backyard um, with the guys that I knew uh, from West Seattle that had a company called Grindline, who now has built skate parks all over the world. Um, um, so a, a lot of it is just having these relationships with these guys that build these parks and then getting them to come out to Montana and build, help build parks early on and contributing a little bit to some of those early parks. And then it just started snowballing. Then like towns started asking for parks and um, a couple a couple other parks got built on their own. My friend P Pete was uh, trying to get a skate park built in Helena, which is the capital. And uh, so I helped him out with that. And then, uh, you know, th the band kept going and like we were, you know, philanthropy became a bigger part of the band. And then all of a sudden the philanthropy outgrew even kind of what the band was doing. So I, I formed my own little foundation to sort of, um, I just decided that this certain percentage of whatever I made touring was gonna go over into this foundation, into this bank account. And um, and then now it's just, now there's like a line of, lineup of small towns that want skate parks because the town next to them got a skate park built. And we yeah, yeah. sort of hit all parts of the state and um, it's just been the most fun, joyful way to be connected to like every part of the state and all these young kids um, who either have been skating for a few years or are just starting to skateboard. Um, it's, um, it's, it's truly like the most fun I've had uh, other than playing music. Yeah. yeah. In, in my life and um every year i have a group of guys that you know there's like 30 40 guys i know from all over the country one guy from costa rica sometimes this guy's from italy they come out we have a big event called the big sandy pig roast which is in my hometown where we built a park uh 10 years ago and uh this year is the 10th anniversary and um we didn't get to do it last year so um it's like the centerpiece of my summer usually like all my friends coming out and making a little four or five day loop around the state a bunch of old guys <laughs> and uh connecting with a bunch of young kids and these old guys are giving young kids lessons and we're hooking them up with new boards and new product and um and so uh it's just the you know it's the super hands-on yeah it, it's 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 uh it's gifting um, but it's like you get to design parks and you get to work with city planners and the mayors of these small towns and 
uh, all the different tribes around the state. It's like, I just feel super connected to the place that I grew up and it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a continued education and it's uh, relationship building in the most fun way ever uh, because it's, it's, uh, old community, it's older community leaders who are my age or younger. And then it's the young, young people. And, um, and it's, you know, I'm just like the cool uncle, you know, it's like the greatest, <laughs> greatest gig ever. So. How involved in the actual, like, down and dirty work of designing a skate park do you get, like, do you do part of the design work yourself as well, or, or sort of the layout work, or do you work in, like, talking about permitting and all that shit that, like, the, the sort of bureaucratic red tape that I'm sure must be a nightmare? Yeah, it's, it, it depends. Like, um, sometimes you need to go to those city council meetings and sort of talk people through, um, like, why and how and all of that. And we've gotten pretty good at it. Um, um, and if I do have a bunch of time off, sometimes I'll spend a couple days, like, actually, like, you know, doing the grunt work. And maybe they'll let me lay, like, the, the lip of the, we use, swimming pool block on the lip of the, some of the pools they'll, they'll let me like lay some of the block and do you know do, do some of the um i mean i'm by far the oldest guy <laughs> out there so, and that's like such hard work that that is like young man yeah, oh yeah like, yeah sh like shoveling and pushing concrete around um especially if you don't do it all the time God, you, yeah. you try to go out and do it once and you're in traction for a week and I, and I, it's how I, you know, I grew up, we're doing that kind of work on farms and stuff. Right. So I, I understand it, but I also am 58 years old. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the design part is super fun. Like I, I usually design the bolt, like if there's a standalone sort of swimming pool type feature in the park. Um, I usually design that and I've, I've skated so many parks around the world that I sort of understand like the geometry and the, like what radiuses like work and what radiuses don't work work and uh, we've tried to really mix up the shapes so like I always say like per capita like Montana by far has like like more diverse great concrete you know to skate than anywhere on the planet and um, and it's and it is just keeping doing different things you know like making sure each park has a has a unique feature. And, has the skate culture changed uh, in Montana since you started skating, however many years, 40 years ago, whatever it was? Like, is it the same sort of style of kids that they're just younger or has the the actual like demographics of who's skating and where they skate, has that changed over the last few decades? Um, I think the type of kid is kind of the same. I think, um, even though I, you know, it's, it's interesting, like I grew up in a small enough town that um you know I played all sports I like played football and basketball ran track but I had a big skate ramp in my yard so I would come home from football practice to eat and then I'd go skate the ramp for three hours um and nobody told me that I couldn't do that you know like yeah. because it was a small town like there wasn't clicks and but typically the kids that we run into um who gravitate towards skateboarding are the kids that aren't the team sports kids and um and I think it was that way when I was a kid. I, I just was in a unique situation in the town that I grew up in. Um, most of the kids that, you know, back in the late 70s that I was skating against in contests, those kids weren't team sports kids. Yeah. Um, those kids were that sort of um, existed in this, you know, skateboarding is, is kind of like half art, half um, sport. And the, you know, the kids, I think the, a lot of the reason they get into it is because of the the cultural um colorfulness you know within uh you know it's 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 as much about like the style of how you skate and what you're wearing and um you know everything that sort of surrounds it like it's there's a real diy aspect to it it's um the individualism part of it is really super important and that's the thing that doesn't really exist in team sports. Team sports, you're wearing a uniform. Yeah. Um, there's lines, and rules, and with skateboarding, there's no lines, there's no rules. In fact, the further you go outside the lines, yeah, right. outside the rules, right. it's sort of the more popular you're going to be. So, um, 
um, it's still it's still that it, you know it's still that same sort of kid that's gravitating towards it, and I think there's a bigger need for it now than there ever has been. Um, I think uh, you know a lot of these kids do have smartphones, so they're they're comparing their their life to the life of you know P Rod or you know whoever the big skateboarder is, you know uh, Nija Houston yeah. who you know who's a you know been a millionaire since he was 18 years old and like right. living this living this life and that the one thing that we can do with these skate parks is we we are bringing them like a world-class piece of concrete that they can sort of assimilate to like oh this is in some cases better than the parks that are in, yeah, yeah. in big cities and um so you know leveling the playing field for a kid in rural montana is really kind of what we're trying to do I think it, you mentioned the social media thing. I, I was talking to my daughter who's 13 and obviously the gold and silver medal uh, women street skaters in the Olympics uh, are 13 years old. And my daughter knows of them through TikTok or, or seeing their videos on social media, which is wild to me. But yeah. I, I suppose it's a it's a updated 21st century version of the way that we grew up watching skate videos. You know? Sure. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Just yeah. In like 30 second snippets. Yeah, 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 and, and the, then there's a 13 year old girl, Sky Brown, who's going to be in the women's bowl uh, contest coming up next week. Um, who I see in California all the time, you know, like I, you know, she's like super sweet, but yeah, she's like unbelievably. I mean, she's like, you know, she's so good, and she's 13, and it's always mind blowing. Like, you know, she'll be with her friends, and her friends will be like, "Hey, try this," and they'll try some trick for the first time, and four or five tries later they're they're doing it better than anybody in the skate park right you know people have been skateboarding for 20 years like pros you know right. like whatever um, so it, it's you know and, and the the brazilian girl got second man i i can't remember her name but i i just love her man. her whole and how the girls are all hugging each other that's and like maybe the best part her. yeah yep it's, it's you don't see that in almost any other part of the olympics right. where there's there's such a it's such a unit um you know and kids from japan china brazil the u.s you know it's like all over the place so it's so cool like really and the women the women are the women are in a really sweet spot right now because it's it feels so pure to me it feels yeah. um i've seen a couple of these exposure contests that they've had down in california where there'll be two three hundred uh girls and women from you know 25 countries at these contests and it, they're all so supportive of one another and it just feels like the best that the world has to offer you know just like just supporting no matter what no matter what what color what right you know sexual preference like whatever right. it's like right it's, it's all good yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 just like watching somebody do something the best they've ever done and and being in their corner for it you know it's so cool yeah i think that to me that was the most inspiring part of watching any of the skateboarding the last few days is the girls uh yeah a because i have a 13 year old and i can't sort of like imagine her doing any of that stuff uh yeah. but b because of the camar camaraderie involved like you said i think there's a girl from the netherlands and then brazil and then china and then japan like back to back to back to back and and yeah. they're all just like i don't want to say bro and out or whatever but it's like they're all supporting each other it's awesome yeah. Yeah. And hopefully that continues. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Thanks for, thanks for uh, chatting with me for well yeah, over an you. hour now. Yeah, been... yeah, yeah, great to meet you. Hopefully, hopefully we make it to New Hampshire to Meadowbrook at some point. I, I live like <laughs> 10 minutes outside of Boston now. So, yeah. you know, I go to Fenway. But really, I think New Hampshire is, again, because I'm a dork. Uh, I think there are four states in the continental U.S. that Pearl Jam hasn't played in. Alaska is Alaska one. being the fifth. Yeah. Delaware, Mississippi, which I I get one of them. Uh New Hampshire, West Virginia, I think are the four. Uh, I think everywhere else is represented. Which again, why would you play New Hampshire? Because we're an hour the best part of growing up where I grew up is that we didn't have anything, but we were an hour away from everything. Like yeah, Verm yeah. Vermont and the lakes and the beach at Boston, like we're within yeah, an hour. Awesome. So why did yeah. you need it? 